Praise God. Lord, have thine own way tonight. That's our desire. That's our goal. I wonder, Ellen, if you can hand me my Bible over there. I left it on the thingy. Thank you. You know, I just want to say this, too, about something real quick. You know, one thing that the, that the Word of God teaches us, the Word of God is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for instruction, uh, correction for instruction in righteousness. What does instruction in righteousness mean? That means it tells you how to do things right. Amen. Righteousness means you're doing it right. It comes from the root word right. And instruction in righteousness is something that I find in many churches you don't hear a lot. Amen. You hear a lot of doctrine, and you'll hear a good deal of reproof, and you'll hear a good deal of correction. But instruction in how to do things right, a lot of preachers don't know how to do that. And what winds up happening is their churches grow up. You know, a church is like a human being. As it gets older and as the people evolve, you know, it grows up, or it's supposed to anyway. And as the church gets older and gets established, it doesn't know how to do things right. And then problems come in, and they choke out the church, and that's when you have church splits, and you have all kinds of negative things that happen, because God's people don't know how to do things right. And when I talk about things like, if you have ought against your brother, go to them. See, that's instruction in righteousness. That's telling you how you're supposed to do things right. And there's another thing that's interesting about what I was saying on that line. I'm just going to throw this out there real quick, because I think it'll really help some folks to understand some things. There are people in this room right now that I know for a flat-out fact grew up in religious circumstances, I'll put it that way, and they had people within the organization that they were part of do something to them that was nasty, evil, sinful, hurtful. And when they went to the hot shots and the higher-ups in the organization or even their own parents to talk about it, the attitude was, hush, hush, don't say anything. That's not right. That's not the way to handle it. And do you know there's a lot of pain in these people's lives today, years later, because they were told, oh, Ellen, just hush, hush it. Don't say anything about it. Just, you know, oh, that'll cause a horrible ruckus in the organization. And we don't want to do that, so just let it ride. You know, God will take care of it. That's not the right way to do things. If we're going to be an apostolic church, we're not just going to be apostolic because we follow the apostles' doctrine and we follow the example of the early church. We're going to be apostolic because we follow completely the instruction in righteousness that the Word of God offers us, and we handle things right. Am I telling the truth? And we do things the right way in our church. We're not going to let, I'm not going to let a child get molested in my church and then have the parents turn around and say, oh, hush, hush, we don't want to cause a problem. That's not going to happen in this church. Do you hear what I'm telling you? Because I want to tell you, according to the Scripture, that child or that individual had the right to go to that person and confront them concerning the crime that had been committed against them. And I tell them the truth. You say, oh, but he was an elder in the church. Well, there's instruction in righteousness concerning that also. The Bible said, receive not an accusation against an elder except in the presence of two or three witnesses. So if you have an elder in the church or a pastor in the church or a deacon in the church who does you dirty and does you wrong, then yes, there is special instruction concerning that. You don't go to them one-on-one. -on -one. You go to them because of their position. You go to them with at least two or three people beside you to stand witness to what you have to say and to their reaction. Do you hear me now? You go to the, you don't, don't you dare go up against the pastor and think you're going to stand face to face against the pastor or against an elder in the church and God's not going to hold you responsible if you don't do things right. But if you do it right, then it can be dealt with properly because that person, from what I understand in the situation that I'm talking about, that person's still part of the same organization and God only knows how many young people that person has done dirty. Do you see what I'm saying? And that all because the people involved didn't want to do it right, according to biblical mandate. If they had done it right, that person would have been dealt with. And hopefully, that you know, it's funny how they'll put people out of their fellowship for every little thing that comes down the pike. And yet here you got somebody molesting children, and they don't say nothing. Isn't that hideous? 
You know, I mean, but see, this is the kind of foolishness, folks, that goes on. And I'm going to tell you, as you learn, Brother Mara, you're going to find out, Brother Mara, going to, every situation that arises, I'm going to say to you, here's what the Scripture says. Here's the right way to deal with it. Am I telling the truth tonight? Amen. That's how this pastor approaches things. You know, I was a little bit disturbed by a conversation this afternoon. Not a lot disturbed, but a little. I don't let things disturb me a lot. But I'll tell you, because I'll tell you why. This book is our only, only foundation. Do you hear me today? You do not contradict this book and say, oh, well, the Spirit led me in that direction, and we did something different than what the Word said. No, because the Spirit will never lead you contrary to the Word. Amen. The Bible said, try the spirits to see whether they be of God or not concerning prophecy. How are you going to try the Spirit? You test it against the Word. And I get nervous when people talk about doing things another way and doing, you know, and, and it not being tested against the Word, but rather, well, it's acceptable because we just feel in the spirit of things it's okay. No, it don't work that way. The Word of God must always be our final authority. And we do not, because of the affirming message that we preach, we are not in a, in a position where, well, we're living examples of what I'm talking about. Oh, no, we're not, because we have not gone up and said, well, the Bible says one thing, but we're believing something different. That's not at all what we're doing. We're not coming along and saying, well, but the Spirit's shown us something different than what the Word says. No, that may be how he believes. That's not how this preacher believes. I believe the Spirit has shown me what the Word really says. And I'm just taking God at his word. Come on now. And if grace is grace, and bless God, I'm going to live grace. And if grace isn't grace, then I'm going to leave the church and have nothing to do with it. But I'll tell you, I'm going to take God at his word. So I don't feel like being an affirming ministry that we're anything like somebody who's gone off in a direction that is contrary to the word. Do you? I don't believe that. I don't believe we've gone off in some goofy direction. I believe we've taken the Word of God. We have carefully examined it. We've looked at passages that cause grief for people and cause misunderstanding in people. We have studiously studied them and looked at them and carefully examined them, and we've come to understand them better. But the doctrine of grace stands alone. I don't care if, I don't care if the Bible condemned homosexuality flat out 100%. Because grace would still apply. Do you hear what I'm telling you today? Churches are full today of people who are divorced and on their second and third and fourth and fifth marriages. And yet they go to church, Ellen, and they feel comfortable and they feel like God, His grace is sufficient for them. Well, if it's good for them, Mary, it's good for me. Amen. God's grace isn't good for one and not for the other. And I get tired. My Bible says when you're divorced and remarried that way, Jesus said, not Paul, not Silas, not Peter, not John. Jesus said you live in adultery so long as you live. Adultery? Well, wait a minute. The Bible said no adulterers are going to get into heaven. But see, they don't see themselves as adulterers, do they? No, because they somehow turn and twist Scripture until it makes them comfortable and until it says what they want it to say. Then they have the audacity to look my way and say, well, all you're doing is twisting Scripture and making her say what you want her to say. (laughs) Oh, good grief. Talk about the pot calling the kettle fat. (laughs) Amen. (laughs) Tonight, I just want to share a few thoughts. I'm not going to take a lot of time. I just want to share a few thoughts with you relative to what we were talking about last week. I thought you might enjoy if I were able to finish this, because last week I couldn't really finish it. We ran out of time. And uh, I try to keep things within roughly a 45-minute time frame. And last week we ran out of time. So I thought if I take about a half hour tonight, we can finish our thoughts on that. You know, we were talking, and there's a reason that I'm talking about this. You might say, well, Brother Morrow, I mean, I think it's all nice and sweet. I think your theory is good and blah, blah, but I don't really see any value in it, but there is value. Because there are people who come to you every day and tell you, he made Adam and Eve, not Adam and Steve. Lie number one. Because it wouldn't have mattered if he'd have made Adam and Steve. It would have been the same thing. Would have been the same. Same. Uh, the benefit would have been the same. He created Eve as a helper. He could have created Steve as a helper, and it would have worked just as well. When they fell, Steve would still have become what we would call a woman today, because of the fact that when they fell, their nature changed, and all of a sudden procreation became necessary. But prior to the fall, procreation was not an issue. And the Bible said man was created, what? A little lower than the angels. 
What does the Bible tell us Jesus said concerning the resurrection? He said that after the resurrection, he said they are neither married nor given in marriage, but they are as what? The angels. They do not have sexual organs. We are not sexual beings after the rapture, after we have been resurrected. We will not be sexual beings anymore because sexuality is part of our fallen nature. Did you hear Sexuality, period. The fact that we as human beings must copulate in order to reproduce is part of our fallen nature from the beginning. So therefore, the need and the desire that human beings have to couple and to find another person with whom to share their life and to build a life, it doesn't matter whether you choose a male or female or what. The reality is that in God's eyes, the Word of God tells us that once we're a child of God, there's neither bond nor free, there's neither male nor female. Is that what the Scripture said? That's what the Scripture says. It's neither bond nor free, Jew nor Greek, male nor female. Once you're a child of God, God looks at you in post-rapture fashion, and he sees you already as a non-sexual, asexual being. Because he's looking at your spirit man, not your physical man. There are a lot of things you do in your body that aren't good for you and that God, uh, you might say, wouldn't be thrilled with. Things that we do in our body, there are a lot of things we do in our bodies that the Lord might not be totally thrilled with. But the reality is he's concerned with our soul. And he's looking at the spiritual man. Now, I just want to read to you something tonight. The Word of God tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter number 15, beginning at verse 42, and this is more of a Bible study tonight than a uh, preaching, a message. So I'm going to let you sit instead of standing for the reading. But this is what Paul writes to the Corinthian church. Uh, 1 Corinthians 15, beginning at verse 42. So also is the resurrection of the dead. The body is sown in corruption. It is raised in incorruption. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. It is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. Did you hear that, Al? It is raised a spiritual body. He didn't say a spiritual being. He said a spiritual body. But now listen to the very next statement he makes. There is a natural body, and there is a spiritual body. Remember what I said about Adam and Eve before the fall? They were created a living soul, a spiritual body. Paul says here, plain as day, there is a natural body which is the flesh, and there is a spiritual body. Now, let's think about this for a second. Jesus said it's better for you to, if, if your hand offends you, cut it off, or if your eye offends you, pluck it out. It's better that you enter the kingdom of God without the eye or without the hand than to go into hell and have all of them, right? Isn't that what he said? Well, isn't it interesting, because according to everything I've ever been told, that when we get to heaven, everything that's ever wrong with us is going to be fixed. So why did Jesus say you're better to cut it off or to pluck it out and go into heaven without it? Why did he say that? Because if, 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 I'm, if, if I'm blind and I get to heaven and all of a sudden I'm going to have working eyes, why did the Lord say that, you know, if I pluck out the eye that I'm going to go into heaven without the eye? Well, look at the Lord when he resurrected from the grave. He still had the scars. He still had the marks, didn't he? Now, anybody that's walking around living and breathing that has scars and a big old hole in their side would bleed to death. So even if he was alive again, he'd have bled a second time. But after he was glorified and he was in that spiritual body, he still had the scars. Hmm, interesting. Because the things that are visited upon us in this body are reflected in our spiritual body. How do you like that? But you see, Ellen was saying to me last Sunday, she said, well, Brother Mark, what about when God 
reached in and took a rib from Adam's side and created Eve. How in the world, if it was just a spiritual body, how could God have done that? Or why would God have done that? Well, here, listen to this, because this is exciting. This is something that will actually kind of tickle you a little bit. Here's Jesus on the cross, hanging there. They weren't quite sure if he was dead. So the soldier came and said, well, I'll make sure he's dead. And he cut a hole in the master's side with his, so, with his spear, right? <laughs> oh, wait till you get this now. God was, oh, hallelujah. God was extracting the church from the Lord's side, just like he took Eve out of the side of Adam. Hallelujah. He extracted the church. He took the church right out of the Lord's side, just like he took that rib from Adam and created Eve for him. He took that rib out of Jesus and created the church for him. How do you like that? Isn't that neat? And after he had done that, the Lord still had that mark. You could still see that demarcation where, the, where his side had been opened and where the church had been extracted, just as I'm sure in Adam you could still see the mark where God had extracted that rib in order to create Eve. Hallelujah. Isn't that exciting? Now, doesn't that inspire you just a little bit? You realize, you remember what I said last week? It makes a great big circle. It just goes around and around and around. You remember the vision in the Old Testament where the Lord is described as a wheel in the middle of a wheel. Amen. That's because while he was moving forward in one direction, he was moving backward in the other direction. Hallelujah. While he was accomplishing something this way, he was just going back to fix it in the other way. He's the wheel in the middle of the wheel. You ever sing a song that talks about the meal? Uh, the meal. The meal in the middle of a meal. Yes, I've had plenty of those out there. But no, th that talks about the wheel in the middle. He's the wheel in the middle of the wheel. I remember an old song we used to sing about that. But see, that's because that's God's nature. While he's moving in one direction, at the same identical time, he's moving in the other direction. While he's moving forward, he's at the same time going backward to fix what was broken. Isn't that something? Who else but God? I remember preaching a message to that effect. Who else but God could do that? Who else but God can move it forward and move backward at the same time and be able to say, I am the beginning and the end. I am the first and the last. I am the Alpha and Omega. I am the finish and I am the start. Hallelujah. It starts with me and it ends with me because I'm able to do both at one time. Praise God. Isn't that exciting? I think it's exciting. The word of the Lord tells us again in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 at verse 44. Again, it is sown a natural body, it is raised a spiritual body. There is a natural body and there is a spiritual body. And so it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living being. I'm reading tonight from the New King James Version. The last Adam became a life-giving spirit. See, Jesus was the second Adam, and he became the Holy Ghost. When he ascended, he said to his disciples, he said, I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. Now, a lot of people who don't have the revelation and know who God is read, and they think the Holy Ghost is the third person of the Trinity, when in reality the Holy Ghost is the Spirit of Christ. That's why Paul said, if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. If the Spirit of God, what we commonly refer to as the Holy Ghost, if the Holy Ghost is something or someone different than the Spirit of Christ, then that means there are two spirits. Am I telling the truth? If the Holy Ghost is a third person, and according to the Word of God, uh, the, if no man can be in the church without having the Spirit of Christ, is what Paul said, then that means there are two different spirits. But the Bible said, for by one spirit are y'all baptized into one body. So therefore, we understand today that the Spirit of Christ and the Spirit of God and the Holy Ghost and the Holy Spirit and the Spirit of the Lord and whatever terms you might read in Scripture all apply to the same Spirit. Because the second Adam became a life-giving Spirit. And when he ascended, he came back to humanity immediately thereafter, ten days after, 
after his ascension. And Tommy, the Jehovah's want to tell you that the Lord came back and established his kingdom in the earth in 1917. No, wrong. He came back 10 days after he ascended and established his kingdom in the earth. Am I telling the truth today? Ten days after he ascended, he came back in spirit form and filled the believers. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound out of heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the house where they were sitting. Jesus had said to his disciples before he ascended, I love this, he said, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. But they didn't get the Holy Ghost right then, Mary. They got blue on. <laughs> the Lord blew on them and said, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. Why did he do that? Because the next time he breathed on them, he wasn't going to breathe on them as a man. He was going to breathe as the, on them as the God from heaven. And suddenly there came a sound out of heaven as of a rushing mighty wind. And it filled all the house where they were sitting. And the disciples and apostles sat there and said, He's doing it again. He's blowing on us again. I feel the wind blowing again. Hallelujah. But this time, we're going to receive the Holy Ghost. And they all received the baptism of the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit of God gave them the utterance. Whew. Because now he was in heaven. A completely different manifestation than as a man on earth. And when he breathed on them from heaven, he was able to fill his room, to fill the room with the noise of that wind. Amen? But now listen, the Bible said, okay, so the first Adam became a living being. The last Adam became a life-giving spirit. And again, to say he be the first Adam became a living being, that doesn't mean he had to be a human being or a flesh and blood being. To be a living being, the Bible said he was a living soul. That's a living being. Amen. And so it is written, the first man Adam became a living being, the last uh, Adam became a life-giving spirit. However, the spiritual is not first, but the natural, and afterward, the spiritual. So you see, the, uh, the Lord started with the soul, the living soul. And then he became a life-giving spirit so that he could breathe life back into what? Our bodies, because we were all laying dead on the sidewalk? No, into our souls. When you become born again, what is the part of you that's born again, Mary? Did you suddenly revert back to a day-old baby? And gah, 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 gah. No, of course not. But your soul was reborn. Your soul, which had no life in it, was suddenly brought to life by the presence of God's Spirit in your life. So it's your spiritual man, which is the part of you that is the foundation of everything that you are. That's what God was dealing with. That's why I love when people say, Well, therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Former things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Glory to God. If you're gay, God will make you straight. If you're black, God will make you white. If you're married, God will make you single. And I love to talk to people about that scripture because, you know, so many preachers love to interpret that scripture all kind of ways. They love to make that scripture, Mary, say what they want it to say. Why, God will just change everything in your life. Bless God. He'll just change everything. Really? My eye color's the same. Amen. The length of my hair didn't change. I didn't lose an ounce or a pound, believe me. If everything changes the way they say, then Ellen, why aren't these things different? Do you see how foolish that whole argument is? You see how dumb? But you know what? How many of us will watch a preacher on TV? He'll get up there and say, bless God, if you're a child of God, then everything changed. God changed everything. He, and if you were gay, he made you straight. And if he did this, he did that. And, he did that. and we'll sit there and feel condemned because we hear these preachers telling us that we're supposed to be different than we are. We're supposed to be something different than we are. But, honey, you know what changed? Your soul changed. All of a sudden, that song I, I sung this morning, Jesus on the inside, working on the outside, all of a sudden the way you saw everything changed. All of a sudden the way you looked at the world changed. All of a sudden the way you wanted to respond to people changed. All of a sudden you felt love where there was hate. All of a sudden you felt satisfaction where there was disgruntlement. All of a sudden you felt uh, compassion where you had had before uh, disgust. 
Because when you come to the Lord and you pray through and you get hold of this good old time Holy Ghost salvation, all of a sudden everything does change. But it's not everything external, it's everything internal. Amen? Am I telling the truth today? I know I am. Amen. And then he goes on to say, and was the man of, uh, oh, I'm sorry, no, let me go up a verse here. 47, verse 47 in 1 Corinthians 15. The first man was of the earth, made of dust. The second man is the Lord from heaven. The Lord from heaven. Oh, saints, listen to me today. Hear, O Israel, the Lord, our God, is one Lord. Hear, O Israel, Jehovah, our God, is one Jehovah. Deuteronomy 6 and 4. When a Jew uses that term and he says, the Lord from heaven, you know that he is speaking of none other than God himself. Because a Jew would never ascribe the term Lord to anyone but God. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. They would never ascribe that term to anyone but God. And to specifically use the phrase, the second man uh, was the Lord from heaven. It speaks clearly that this man was saying, Paul was saying, the second Adam was God. It was God himself. Amen. And then he goes on to say, and was the man of dust, so also are those who are made of dust, and as is the heavenly man, so also are those who are heavenly. In other words, we're created in, in, as Adam was, was uh, created. And at the same time, when we're born again, we become like Jesus. And as we have borne the image of the man of dust, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly man. Hallelujah. Uh, this is interesting because notice that Paul here is using the future tense. He said, and as we have borne the image, which is past tense, of the man of dust, which is Adam, he said, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly man, which is Jesus, which speaks in the future tense. He didn't say, uh, as we've already borne the image of Adam, now we've borne the image of He didn't say that. He said, we shall bear. We shall bear. We shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. It's going to happen one day. That's the great promise of the church. The great promise of the church, Ellen, isn't that I'm everything today that God ever wants me to be. The great promise of the church is that if I can keep my faith intact, one day I will be everything that God wants me to be. One day, Mary, I'm going to get there. One day I'm going to be perfect. I'm not perfect today, believe me, but one day it's going to happen. Because I believe God, I take him at his word, I trust him, I believe what he said he means and what he means he says. And I believe he'll keep his promise and he's not going to cut me short because he said he'd do it, he's going to do it. Paul goes on to say, Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does corruption inherit incorruption. It is impossible for us to inherit the kingdom of God in our present form. It's impossible. It'll never happen. We've got to go back to what Adam was before the fall. We've got to go back to our pre-fall condition or our pre-fall character before we're able to inherit the kingdom of God. But that's what's going to happen between the ground and the clouds is we're going to experience that change. Hallelujah. And this is what Paul then goes on to say. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised incorruptible. And we shall be changed. Oh, hallelujah. Thank God for that promise. Aren't you excited tonight to know that we're going to be changed? I'm so glad to know that one day I'm not even going to be troubled with sexuality. Hello now. I'm glad that's not even going to be an issue in my mind. I'm glad it's not even going to be part of my life's existence. I'm glad that one day I'm not going to have to eat food to live. I'm glad that one day I'm not going to have to drink water to survive. One day I'm going to get past all this. 
Amen. Because I'm going to be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption. And this mortal must put on immortality. How was Adam created originally? Immortal. How can he be immortal? How can he live forever? How could he be created and designed to live forever? He had to be a living soul. He had to be a spiritual being. He had to be in a spiritual body. That is the only thing that makes sense. It's the only way it was possible. He had to be in a spiritual being because this corruption must put on the incorruption. Because if he had been created like us, then he would have been created corruptible. Because how could he be created like us and yet not be corruptible? Do you follow what I'm trying to say? How could he be created in flesh and blood originally like us and not be corruptible? It's impossible because this flesh and blood is corruptible just by reason of its nature. So if he had been created this way from the get-go, he immediately would have been subject to corruption. Immediately. There's just no way around it. But the Bible said God breathed into Adam's nostrils and he became a living soul. And it's so interesting to me because, like I said last week, how many years, I wonder, was Adam here before he fell? It could have been millions. The Bible said that with God, a day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years is as a day. And when you're in that existence as a living soul, I imagine time is the same for you. Wouldn't you think? So therefore, Adam could have been here for millions and millions of years for all we knew, tending the garden with Eve, doing the job that God had created him to do, and Lord only knows how long he was there doing it before he finally succumbed to the temptations of the enemy and, and disobeyed God. So when science says, well, this could be millions of years old, and that, I say, okay, that doesn't hurt me, that doesn't bother me, that doesn't hurt my feelings. I don't feel like they are necessarily contradicting the Word of God. If anything, they're proving my theory you know, if anything, they're just proving that what I said is so. Yeah, I agree with you, because Adam could have been here as a living soul for God only knows how long before he finally disobeyed God and fell. Amen. I wonder how long. The Bible says, if you remember, the Scripture says that Jesus spoke and said, I beheld Satan fall as lightning. Remember when the Lord said that? According to Scripture, the world already existed when, when Satan fell. Am I right? Well, they had to be. You can't fall to earth if the earth doesn't exist. Right? You can't, you can't fall to earth if the earth doesn't exist. So apparently, Satan, in his, in his puffed up mind, in his, his imagination, wanted to rule the earth and wanted to be as God. And in his pride, the Bible said he fell. Not that he was cast out of heaven but that he fell out. How do you like that? When you take on sin, it's kind of like walking on clouds. When you're a spiritual being and you're walking in holiness and righteousness and perfection, then you can walk on the clouds. You can walk on the water like Jesus did, and not a single earthly element will affect you. But you know what? You let pride and sin come into your life, and, sweetheart, it's going to pull you out of your position so fast your head will spin. Because Satan fell out of heaven. He literally just, that, that, that which had entered his heart literally just pulled him right out of heaven. Just pulled him right out of the throne, uh, throne room of God. Said, no, you've got that in your heart. You don't have any place here. Doesn't the Bible tell us that sin cannot enter therein? Doesn't it tell us that? Yes, it does. And Jesus said, I beheld Satan fall as lightning. He said, I saw when he was overcome by his own sin. I saw when he was overcome by his own greed and his own lust and his own pride. And when that happened, he literally just fell to the earth like a rock. He said, and I saw it. I was there to watch it. But you know what? If the earth existed when Satan fell, when did Satan fall? How long had Adam already been here? Adam could have been here for millions of years before Satan even fell. And then was it his first, was it Lucifer's first order of business to try to tempt Adam and Eve once he fell? We don't know that. Again, you know, we don't know whether he fell and then in the very next breath he was trying to deceive Adam and Eve. We don't know that or whether he kind of hung around for a little while before he did that. We don't know. 
You see, folks, I'm going to tell you, one of the most important things any preacher can do, in my mind, the Lord called me years ago, and he told me when I was a kid, he told me I'd have a prophetic ministry. I love to hear people talk about stuff. Oh, these people had a prophetic ministry. They came in and were telling people all this stuff about themselves and all that. And I'm sitting there and I listen and I think, you don't even know what a prophetic ministry is. Those are parlor tricks. Amen. I'm going to tell you straight plain. Those are parlor tricks. You can get you get some of these uh, so-called uh, mediums on television that get up on television and they're talking to dead people. And you'll notice that as they're speaking to the person, you know, am I right? Am I right? And that's so, uh, and that's, you know, and they're feeding them one little piece of information at a time. And these people have hewn their skills so that they're able to read every little blink and every little tear that falls out of your eye till they're able to keep putting little pieces together and make it sound like they know everything about you and they don't know nothing, but they're able to read you like a book. Listen, if John Edwards can do it on television, if Sylvia Brown from uh, uh, Montel Williams fame, if she can do it on television and sit there and do this with people, what makes you think there aren't people running around the church do the same thing? It's not a prophetic ministry. I'm going to tell you what a prophetic ministry is. A prophetic ministry, according to the Word of God, is when the man of God gets up and says, Thus saith the Lord. That's a prophetic ministry. Do you know Brother Morrow has a prophetic ministry when I'm sitting in the middle of Golden Corral? Amen. Say, what do you mean by that? I'll tell you what I mean by that. If it ain't the Word of God and if it isn't what God has to say, it's not going to come out of my mouth. But if it is, I'm going to say it. Amen. Because the Spirit of the Lord is upon me, for he hath anointed me to preach the gospel. The, the Spirit of the Lord has anointed me to, to defend truth and to speak truth. And God said to me as a young person, he used uh, Jeremiah chapter 1 to speak to me, because I, I was a young person when I started ministry. I started a youth ministry at the age of 12, and I was a youth evangelist as Jiggle the Clown. Yes, Jiggle, and of course I grew into that name. And I'm going to read to you a little bit here, just as, as a point of reference tonight. But the Lord, I, I used to wrestle with God. I said, Lord, how in the world... Can you have, how can you call me to a prophetic ministry? Look who I am. I'm nobody. I used to have a terrible nervous condition when I was a kid. As a Lord, how in the world? Nobody will want to listen to me. Nobody will want to hear what I have to say. And I opened my Bible, and the Lord said, look down. And I looked down, and immediately my eyes fell on Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 5. It's the first place my eye looked. And I began to read, and tears just started coming to my eyes because I couldn't believe that God, it was just like he sent me, a, 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 you know, a telegram. Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I sanctified you. And I ordained you a prophet to the nations. Then said I, Ah, Lord God, behold, I cannot speak, for I am a youth. Now, how apropos is this portion of Scripture when you're just a 12-year-old kid? I cannot speak, for I am a youth. But the Lord said to me, Do not say I am a youth, for you shall go to all to whom I shall send you, and whatever I command you, you shall speak. That is a prophetic ministry.